<sighs> well, this has been an interesting time. Howdy, howdy guys, Ponchato here, and welcome to Monthly Builds for April of 2020, Pandemic Edition. In this series, I cover PC builds at various budgets every month and industry news. In this episode, we'll take a look at parts for a $950 mid-range gaming PC and parts for just about the cheapest usable computer you can currently put together at under $400. Be sure to hit that subscribe button to stay up to date. But before we get started, this video is brought to you by Ivacy VPN. With more people studying and working from home than ever before, security and privacy have never been so important. Ivacy VPN can help keep you secure online on almost any platform. Follow the link in the description below to sign up today. We'll get started with the big story first. Coronavirus. You've all already heard the experts' opinions, so here's my hot take on the issue. I expect, now I might be wrong, but I expect major disruptions to everyday life to continue for another month or two in most countries, whereas the economic nuke that went off as soon as everyone realized that this actually is pretty serious is gonna take like six to 12 months to recover from maybe a little bit longer. The layoffs aren't coming, they're already here, but the world is not ending. Humanity will still exist three years from now and it'll still be trying its level best to make the planet uninhabitable. In short, I'm not too worried about it. Also, why is everybody hoarding toilet paper? That doesn't even make sense. Welcome to 2020. Now this actually does have an impact on computers and hardware because of the effects we've seen on supply chains. Shipments out of China, which produces probably more than like two thirds of the world's electronics, have been delayed or outright stopped for a while now because of COVID-19. What that means for us is that component stock is thinning out and some computer parts may just be out of stock for several weeks or even months. Given that reality, when putting together the builds this month, I opted for higher volume models to maximize the likelihood that you'll actually be able to get the parts before sometime this summer. Okay, enough about coronavirus, on to actual PC news. Intel is up first. In a presentation at an investor conference, Team Blue's CFO said Intel wouldn't be matching AMD's 7 nanometer node until the end of 2021. That's not great news for Intel because AMD's next node shrink to 5 nanometers is slated to be released not long after in 2022. He went on to say about their 10 nanometer node that, well, I can just give you the direct quote. Look, this just isn't going to be the best node that Intel has ever had. It's going to be less productive than 14, less productive than 22, end quote. So at least Intel is openly admitting that they have been messing up. The first step to fixing a problem is admitting that you have one. Speaking of problems, back in March, Intel CPUs were hit with another set of vulnerabilities, dubbed the Load Value Injection, or LVI, vulnerabilities. And according to a report by the Register, mitigations from these could dramatically hit performance. In the interest of maintaining some objectivity, I will give Intel praise for not stopping their bug bounty program. If it weren't for Intel paying security researchers for finding these security problems with their processors, the only people who would ever find them would most likely be bad actors, who would then most likely use those vulnerabilities against governments, businesses, and people. So props to Intel for continuing the bug bounty program and making the risky but necessary move to secure their products. I do think this will pay off for them dramatically in the future. Not to be left out of the fun, AMD processors also got hit with a vulnerability, dubbed the cache attack vulnerabilities, which affects AMD CPUs going back to 2011. Basically, by reverse engineering part of the CPU cache in AMD microarchitectures, security researchers found two methods of attack which allow for monitoring the target CPU's memory access. So hey, don't think AMD is free from security problems either. Still on AMD, the fourth generation Ryzen processors based on the Zen 3 microarchitecture are expected to launch around September of this year, according to a report from Digitimes. The new CPUs will most likely be fabricated on an updated 7 nanometer node and will include a design change that drops the CCX arrangement of cores and will likely have clock speed increases from the updated node. Oh, and they'll still be on the AM4 socket, though power requirements and compatibility with older motherboards is still, as of yet, unknown. Because of coronavirus, a significant number of conferences have been canceled, but probably the biggest loss in the gaming arena has been E3. For a short while, they were planning to transition to an online-only event, but they've since completely canceled it. 2020 is really not taking any prisoners. Finally, one last story on gaming, this one a little bit less sad. Activision and Infinity Ward launched Call of Duty Warzone, which is a free-to-play battle royale. Normally, I don't bring individual game launches up that much, but Warzone is actually 
Like, it's really fun. The short description is 150 players and either solo, three-man, or four-man squads. But it has two features that I really like that also differentiate it a bit from other Battle Royale games. The first is contracts, which you can pick up in-game, which task you with completing an objective to get money, which then you can use to buy upgrades at shops located around the map. The second feature is definitely the coolest and one that I use almost every time I play. Warzone supports crossplay between PC, Xbox, and PlayStation. A lot of my friends play partially or exclusively on consoles, so being a PC gamer, it's hard to find stuff we can all play together. Warzone supports that. Cool stuff. The game is still basically like an early access. It still has quite a few bugs and the servers are often complete garbage, but overall I think it's a lot of fun, especially when the servers are working. Plus it's free to play, so it's definitely worth giving it a try if you like Battle Royale or Call of Duty style first person shooters. All right, so we're up to date with all of that. Now let's look at the builds. Like I mentioned at the beginning of the video, I opted for components with good availability in light of the global supply chain snafu we've been coaxed into. Given the probably big increase in people new to PC games, I went with more affordable budgets this month. A sub $400 build for absolutely bare basic entry level gaming at the lowest budget possible, and a $950 build for higher end performance. First up, the $400 build. For the CPU, I went with a Ryzen 3 3200G for $95. This is just about the cheapest CPU with integrated graphics that can handle esports and basic gaming at low resolutions and minimal quality presets. It's a four core processor with a max boost clock of four gigahertz, so it has very reasonable computing performance for an entry level PC. The most important factor here though is price. There simply aren't any other CPU and GPU combinations available for less than $100 like this one. For the motherboard, I went with Gigabyte's B450M DS S3H for $73. It's pretty bare bones, but it has everything you'd want in a basic build. Four RAM slots, so you can add more memory later. It's compatible with Ryzen 3000 CPUs, and it has an M.2 slot for simple SSD installation. For the memory, I went with Corsair's Vengeance LPX 8GB kit for $48. This is basic 2400 MHz RAM, but for an extreme budget build like this, 8 GB of 2400 MHz memory is worth the cost savings. For the SSD, I went with the Western Digital Blue 500 GB M.2 for $70. Again, this is a budget pick. It's a SATA drive, so max read and write speeds are 560 and 530 MB per second, and total capacity of 500 GB to keep the cost down. Power will come from Thermaltake's Smart 430 Watt for $38. This is one of the best budget options available at this this time. It's 80 plus certified, comes with a five year warranty, and it has all the important circuit protections that you'd want in a power supply. Plus these days, processors and graphics cards are so efficient that even 430 watts gives you quite a bit of headroom to upgrade in the future. Finally, the case I picked is the Fractal Design Core 1100. Like the other components, this is just a bare bones basic pick, but it's more than adequate for an inexpensive build like this. It includes a front 120 millimeter fan, dust filters, and vibration dampened three and a half inch drive mounts if you decide to add a hard drive in the future. Altogether, these parts come out to $369, which is actually about the cheapest reasonably usable PC you could build today with PC gaming in mind. If you can swing a bit higher budget, the easiest upgrade and most obvious one would be dropping in an RX 570 graphics card for about $120. That would dramatically improve performance in games and it's a very simple upgrade to make. Click the link in the description below to pick up these parts for yourself. Now for the higher end build at $950, I went with the Ryzen 5 1600 AF version for $85. This is the 12 nanometer refresh of the original 14 nanometer 1600, so it's basically a downclocked Ryzen 5 2600. Plus at 85 bucks, this is probably the best price to performance processor that you can buy today. It has six cores, 12 threads, and a boost clock up to 3.6 gigahertz. That's a pretty good deal for only 85 bucks. For the graphics card, I went with the XFX RX 5700 XT Thick 3 Ultra for $410. That's a bit of a mouthful. The 5700 XT is about the highest performance graphics card you can get before diminishing the returns really starts tanking the value. And just as a quick note on driver support here, because a lot of people have been complaining about the 5700 and 5700 XT's issues these last couple of months. I have an RX 5700 in my main PC right now, and I've been using it for uh, nine months, give or take. It had some pretty irritating issues like black screens earlier in the driver cycle, but the most recent driver version 
has pretty much fixed all the problems that I've experienced with it. Three months ago, I probably would have recommended an NVIDIA GPU because of those driver issues, but today AMD's drivers are working properly. So the RX 5700 XT with its better price to performance ratio gets the pick. Anyway, for the motherboard, I went with the MSI B450 Gaming Plus Max for $105. This board has a strong VRM, extended memory speed support, and most importantly, has MSI's updated BIOS chip that allows for proper compatibility with Ryzen 3000 CPUs. So when you want to upgrade from your already very capable Ryzen 5 1600, you'll be able to jump up to an even higher performance and higher core count Ryzen 3000 CPU. For memory, I went with Corsair again, their Vengeance LPX 16 gigabyte kit for $86. This kit runs at 3200 megahertz with C16 latency to maximize performance of the Ryzen processor. Plus 16 gigabytes is probably going to be more than enough memory for at least the next several years. The SSD I went with is Adata's SU800 one terabyte for $120. It's just a basic SATA SSD, but in my opinion, it's worth it for the cost savings over getting an NVMe drive, at least at this budget. Plus, one terabyte is enough storage that most people won't need to add any more for quite a while if they have to at all. For power, I went with EVGA's 600BQ for $68. It's 80 plus bronze, 600 watts, semi-modular, and it has a fluid dynamic bearing on the fan for an overall very good value at a reasonable price. The main selling point is the semi-modular cables though, so you don't have to deal with cable management for any unnecessary cables in your case. And for the case, I went with Cooler Master's Masterbox Pro 5 RGB for $70. I think this is one of the best looking mid-range cases and includes several really nice features. The side panel is tempered glass. It's equipped with three 120 millimeter RGB fans in front and one in the back for strong stock cooling. And it has a partial power supply shroud with toolless drive cages in the front. It has a good layout for a clean interior and very nice styling on the outside as well. With everything together, these parts come out to $944, just under budget. These components will get you a very capable gaming PC with strong upgrade options and still come in at a reasonable sub $1,000 price tag. Click the link in the description to pick up these parts for yourself. And that's it for this edition of Monthly Builds. Assuming the world doesn't collapse, I'll see you guys in the next episode. Hit subscribe and click the bell icon to get notified of new videos as soon as they're up. If you like this video, hit the like button. If you want to see more, hit subscribe. And I want to hear from you. On a scale from one to yes, how are you liking this whole work and study from home thing? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching. I hope I helped and I'll see you in the next video. A lot of people have been asking me how well I've been handling the whole stay at home quarantine thing, but like I work by myself from home anyway, so almost nothing has changed. Maybe I'm doing something wrong here.